Good morning. Bit of a false start, some technical difficulty by error of the user and operator. So just wanted to say good morning to you as you are beginning to log in this morning. We would love to have you uh, just let us know that you're here. We'd love to know who's worshiping with us this morning. Uh, just uh, grateful for this opportunity to be here together today on this Easter Sunday. We're going to give folks a few more uh, seconds or so to log in. Please be sure to just let us know that you're here. I know uh, Mandy is going to be helping with the hosting today, but I think she's enlisted some uh, assistance from Athena and Pam and Renee. And so uh, when my wife's done, she'll also be helping uh, just connect with folks, but make sure that you let us know that you're here. We're excited to worship with you today here on this Easter Sunday. And if you didn't have a chance to check out my surprise sunrise service devotional, I want to encourage you to go back and watch that video a little bit later. But as we enter into this time together, I just want to invite you to worship with us a well-known song of this Easter season.
Jesus Messiah. He is the resurrected Lord. I know many of you, perhaps even most of you, have already done this in the chat feature today. But I would like to do something a little bit different and try and do it all together. So if you'll get your fingers ready to type, I want you to go to your little chat window box and type in the words, but don't hit return, don't hit enter yet. Type in, He is risen indeed. And then the word hallelujah. So He is risen indeed. And the word hallelujah, I want you to type those in. And in just a moment, I'm going to have you all click send all at the same time. In the tradition of the early church, they have been greeting one another on Easter Sunday morning with those familiar words, he is risen. And when that greeting was extended to someone else, the response was he is risen indeed. And then the words hallelujah. So we're going to do that all together. I'm going to say the words and then you're going to hit enter with your response, and we're gonna get just a, we're gonna blow up Facebook today with that response from everyone. So here we go. He is risen, and then you type in your response. So would you do that right now? He is risen, church. Love watching that feed. Just continue to scroll with all of those responses from you today as we celebrate our risen Lord. <clears throat> Again, just so glad that you have joined us today. If you have not just kind of checked in and let us know that you're watching today, I want to encourage you to do that. We would love to know who is in the room today, whether you're part of our Ravenna Church family or whether you're folks that are extended family or even guests that have perhaps joined us today. Just want to let you know that as a part of our church Facebook page that you're on now, there's some extra, extra content that you can engage with today. We have a digital connect card. It's a great way for you to let us know that you're here. It's a great way that we can care for you and help connect with you. So if you want to take uh, a few moments today and click on that link for the connect card, just give us your name, your email address. If you have a prayer request or a question for us, we'd love for you to fill that out and send it to us. I also just want to remind you that uh, you can stop back at our church Facebook page through the week for additional content. We've been doing our Wednesday night Bible study on our Facebook page. Love to have you um, engage with that and be a part of our discussion. Uh, throughout the week, we're doing some Zoom meetings just as a chance to be connected with one another. Uh, love to have you join me on Tuesdays from 1 to 2 or perhaps on Saturday mornings from 1030 to 1130. 
And uh, I would also just want to point you to our church Facebook group. We'd love to have you become connected there. So if you're interested in that, at all in that, you'll just go to our, our Facebook group and just indicate your interest. We'd love to be able to connect with you additionally there. It's a place where we share prayer requests. It's a place where we have dialogue and we support one another throughout the week. And we'd love to be able to do that with you as well. So as we begin today on this Easter Sunday... I uh, just want to share a little bit more about uh, myself. Some of you may not know uh, a lot of detail about me. We're filming now from the living room of our house today. Uh, if you all get kind of silent in the midst of the preaching today, uh, we have asked Winston, our dog, to be ready to, uh, to bark an amen. And uh, if he gets a little too rambunctious or uh, excited about the sermon today, we may have to put him in his cage. We've also had a very interesting experience this last week. We have a robin who's been camping outside of our house on the, the tree just outside our front window and has been repeatedly, for hours on end, flying into that window. So if at some point in time you start to hear a, a repetitive banging, that's that lovely bird that's been joining us uh, outside of our window today. But just welcome into our home. We're glad to be uh, together today in this setting. For those that may not know this, I'm a bit of a kind of a history buff or an archaeology kind of buff. I, uh, I used to carry a, a subscription to Biblical Archaeology magazine because I just am fascinated by all of the things that folks have been able to discover down through the years. Uh, I'm fascinated as I read stories about the new technology that's being used to discover things. They're using satellite imagery to detect cities that are hidden underneath the, the canopy of jungles. They are using something called ground penetrating radar, which helps them find things that are hidden to the human eye, helps us find things without having to actually dig up. I love TV shows like uh, The Mystery of Oak Island, The Curse of Oak Island, and uh, the fact that they keep digging away, trying to find things that have been buried perhaps there. On occasion, I even watch a, a, a video on YouTube uh, about metal detectors, guys that go around old battlefields or in other places doing some metal detecting and fascinated by the things that they find. Some of you perhaps watching today may even remember an old TV show from years and years ago called In Search Of. That was the whole premise. They were in search of things, trying to find things that had been lost or hidden away because of time. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes we all lose things and... Uh, you start to look for them everywhere, and you find out in the end that they were right there in front of your face. Uh, I have shared with some of you before that my vision is, is not very good without my glasses. And so if I lay my glasses down and forget where they are, I have a hard time finding them. So I always lay them on the end of our dresser at night when I go to sleep because I know right where to go to find my glasses and be able to see again. But sometimes you look for things like your keys, or maybe it's a book, or... Uh, some item of jewelry, a watch, or something like that. And you looked all over the place only to find that it's right there in front of you. Maybe it was in your pocket, or maybe you put your sunglasses on top of your head and uh, you didn't have a clue that they were there. I remember my mother once misplacing a mug that she had that she was drinking tea out of when she was working outside. Uh, and then she got in our pickup truck and she drove it down the road to her mom's house where we were dumping some things that were in the back of that pickup truck, only to get out of the truck and discover that that mug was sitting right on the running board of her truck. She had completely forgot about it. It was right there in front of her, but she didn't see it when she climbed into the vehicle. Sometimes the things that keep you and I from finding stuff is the stress of our lives. Maybe we're in a hurry and that stress of uh, needing to leave the house quickly causes us to overlook things that are right in front of us. Sometimes it's worry about something else that distracts us and we miss the things that are right in front of us. Sometimes it is pain and suffering or other things that blind us to what is right there in front of us. Well, during this particular pandemic crisis, uh, we've lost a lot of things. And many people feel like they have lost things that are very important. And one of the things that many people feel like they have lost is hope. But even apart from the pandemic, there are folks every day, perhaps it is even you today, that you feel like you have no hope and you are looking for it, but it seems to be elusive. Well, last week I shared with you a message about misplaced hope and how people on that very first Palm Sunday, when Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem, they were looking for hope, but they had placed their hope in something that was false. 
Today I want to talk to you a little bit more about hope, but specifically today I want to talk to you about how you can find hope. Because the bottom line is, no matter where you are today, no matter what you are going through, no matter what you've done, in Jesus, in our resurrected Lord today, you can find hope. And so today I want to help you not only find hope in Jesus, I want to help you learn how to live it better and how to share it with other people. So to do that, we're going to turn to three stories in the Gospels. They are stories from the Gospel of John and one from the Gospel of Luke. And they are stories that remind us about hope and how it can be blocked from our eyes, blocked from our understanding. But not only that, how we can actually find hope and live it and share it. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me for a moment before we open up God's Word. And let's pray and ask Him to bless and lead our time together. Oh God, today... I pray that in these moments that we spend together in your word, that you would help us to hear truth today. That, Lord, you would help us to recognize the things that blind us and block us from experiencing resurrected hope in Jesus Christ. That you'd help us to not only identify those blockages, but, Lord, that you would help us today find hope and learn how to live it and share it. God, we thank you for who you are. And we thank you for this day, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. If you have a Bible and you want to turn with me today, we're going to begin in John's Gospel. So the beginning of the New Testament, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels. John's Gospel, chapter 20. And we're going to begin in the first verse of chapter 20. So hear from God's Word with me today. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark, and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Peter also came following him and entered the tomb. He saw the, lin the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth that had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had come first to the tomb then also entered and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary... And he, she is our first person that we'll look at today. But Mary was standing outside of the tomb, weeping. And so, as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. See, there was an amen from Winston already. Thanks, Winston. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. And Mary came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. So let's kind of set the scene here, scene a little bit here. Here is Mary Magdalene, one of the women who were a part of the company of followers of Jesus. She had been uh, there throughout a long portion of Jesus' earthly ministry. She was one whom Jesus had cast out seven demons. She was someone who had experienced a measure of the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. Yet this Easter Sunday, this first Easter Sunday, she is without hope. She seems to feel that all has been lost. She had been, according to scriptures, the other gospel accounts, at the cross when Jesus was crucified. She had witnessed Joseph of Arimathea laying Jesus' body in the tomb. And Mark, 
chapter 16 and in Luke chapter 24, the scriptures record that she came early with spices to finish preparing Jesus' body for burial. But as we look at our text in verse 11, we see and hear what has kept Mary from hope. Verse 11 says, But Mary was standing outside of the tomb, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped and to look into the tomb. Mary has returned to the tomb. She has been there first. She sees that it's empty. She goes to tell Peter and John, but then she goes back. And in her grief, she is unable to find hope. She actually articulates her grief and her hopelessness three different times in this 20th chapter. The first happens back at the beginning of the chapter when she tells Peter and John. She says in verse number two, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. She articulates similar words to the angels whom she encounters in the tomb. When they ask, why are you weeping? She responds in verse 13, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. And the third time, it is in response to Jesus' question, why is she weeping and who is she seeking? And she says one more time, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Mary's grief keeps her from experiencing hope. It actually keeps her from recognizing Jesus himself. So here's a question for you today, and I believe that Mandy has posted these questions a little bit earlier uh, as a part of the live stream, but here's a question for you that I'd love to hear your response. Today, what is the source of your deepest pain? Where does your hurt lie deepest for you? Where is that pain and that grief, that loss, keeping you from hope today? If you're brave enough to share it, I would love to hear what keeps you from experiencing hope? Because that is a part of the lesson that we want to learn today. That hope sometimes is blocked from us because of grief and shame and grief and pain and loss. And we need to acknowledge that. It is only when we acknowledge that hurt and pain can hope come. What is the source of your deepest pain? But thank the Lord on this resurrection day that Mary is not stuck in her hopelessness. Hope indeed comes to her. She can find hope, perhaps anew, or perhaps today you can find hope for the very first time. Because no matter what that source of pain, no matter what that source of grief or loss is in your life, there is hope for you and I in Jesus. And that hope is found, her eyes are opened when Jesus speaks her name. Verse 16, Jesus calls out her name, Mary, and in that moment, her eyes are open and she recognizes who Jesus is. I think there are a couple truths that I want us to, to note in that speaking of her name. The first is this, I want you to take hope today because Jesus sees you. Jesus saw Mary there in the garden in her hopelessness. In her grief and her pain and her loss, Jesus sees her, and just as he saw her, Jesus sees you and I today. And that should give us hope. And not only does Jesus see you and I, but just as he did with Mary, I believe Jesus wants to speak and is speaking your name and my name. So here's another question for you to engage with today that maybe you would want to share a little bit as a part of our chat today. In the midst of the hopelessness of grief, pain, and loss, Jesus will speak your name. And so my question for you is, have you heard him speak your name today? Do you long to hear Jesus speak your name? Maybe it's to hear your name, Linda, or Wendy, or Mandy, or George, or Art, or Shirley. Jesus today is speaking your name, and will you hear it, and will it give you hope today? I pray that it will. So as he speaks her name, hope comes to Mary, and hope can come to you and I. The close of that passage in chapter 20, 
Jesus tells her in verse 17, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. One of the great truths of this Easter season that I want us to hold on to today, I want us to hear perhaps fresh and new, or maybe you've never heard it for the first time, is that no matter where you are today, no matter what your experience has been, no matter how long perhaps you have been stuck in a place of hopelessness because of grief and pain and loss, you are not discarded or, or disqualified. Jesus could have looked at Mary and said, shame on you, Mary, for not believing. Why do I want to even waste my time with you? But he says to her these words, my father and your father, my God and your God, and while that was a message that she was to take back to the other disciples, it was also a message for her. You see, hope comes through Jesus Christ because he embraces us as family. He embraces us in warm and loving relationship. He is my God and your God. He is my Father and your Father. What hope there is in that, that we are not disqualified or discarded. And we're not only embraced in this life of hope, but Jesus tells Mary that hope is not something that we keep to ourselves. Hope sends us on mission. Also in that 17th verse, he begins by saying, now go to your brothers and tell them these things. Hope is not something that we're to keep to ourselves. We are called to go to others with a message of hope. Hope, you can find it, you can live it, and you can share it. And so she comes announcing to the disciples in verse 18 exactly what she has experienced with Jesus. Now, if you look very, very closely at her story, it's very short. In fact, it is a single verse what she says to them. I have seen the Lord. And then she recounts what the Lord has said to her. You see, sharing the hope of Jesus does not have to be elaborate or fancy it does not have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be movie-worthy for you to share your story. Mary doesn't even try and explain any deep or theological underpinnings of her faith. She simply shares her experience. I have seen the Lord. Today, if you are someone who has found the hope of Jesus Christ, you're called to go and share that with others. And all you simply need to share is that you have seen and encountered the Lord. You have heard him speak your name and share the hope that he has brought into your life. Whether you're hurting or you're grieving, there is hope in Jesus today that can be lived and shared. But there's another story in the Easter account that we can turn to. If you'll turn back to your left a few pages in the Bible to Luke's Gospel, the 24th chapter we hear a story called the Road to Emmaus story. It's in chapter 24 of Luke's Gospel. And I pick it up by reading in verse 13. And Luke records this scene for us. Behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. So this is recorded on Easter Sunday. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you're talking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which had happened here in these days? And Jesus says to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all of the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. And besides all of this, it is the third day since these things happened. And some of the women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning today, they did not find his body. And they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said to them that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found just exactly as the women had said, but they did not see him. 
And Jesus said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all of the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all of the scriptures. So they approached the village where they were going. He acted as though he was going further. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Were not our hearts burning with us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them. Breaking of the bread. So again, setting the scene, here are disciples, a part of those close followers of Jesus, not a part of the original twelve that Jesus had called, but a part of those close followers. Perhaps they could have been a part of the 70 or the 120 that Jesus sent out that the Gospels record. But just like Mary, their eyes were blinded to the hope that was right there in front of them. They failed to recognize Jesus. Now, some scholars believe that this was a divine work that, that God prevented them from seeing some suggest that perhaps because they had last seen Jesus as a broken body hanging on the cross, that they did not recognize him in now his resurrected body. But here's a truth. Sometimes God restrains our vision in order to deepen our trust of him, to increase the fullness of the hope that we encounter. I also want you to another, notice some other details about this conversation that takes place. Jesus joins them on the road and he does not immediately rebuke them for what they're saying. Rather, he simply listens and asks questions. He displays patience and grace. It's an important lesson for us as we try and help others navigate through times of crisis or to navigate through this particular time of crisis. Sometimes the best things that we can do is just come alongside, to listen, to ask questions. He asks them why they have no hope, and they articulate a couple different reasons. They articulate in verse 17 that it is in connection to their grief. It says that they are standing there looking sad. They are mourning the loss of Jesus. Verses 22 through 24 articulate that a part of their inability to find hope this day is a measure of unbelief. They have heard stories from other followers of Jesus that the tomb is empty and that angels have come and have announced that Jesus is alive, but they do not believe. But even more than that, there's another important reason that they miss truth, that hope is right there in front of them. And it's found in verse 19. Verse 19 says that they relate to Jesus these things about Jesus the Nazarene, that he was a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all of the people. And verse 21 says, We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. They had a wrong perspective, a wrong expectation, a wrong understanding of who Jesus was and what he had come to do. They saw him simply as a, a prophet that was mighty, and word and deed, they saw him only, perhaps, or at least in a limited way, as the physical redeemer of Israel. So here's a question for you today. Here's a question for us to wrestle with. What false expectation about life or about Jesus is causing you or keeping you from experiencing hope? What false expectation about your life or about Jesus is keeping you today from experiencing hope. Maybe you thought today that this coronavirus would not be a very big deal, that it would be something that was here today and gone tomorrow. And that false expectation now has been shattered and you find yourself without hope today. Maybe you thought it wouldn't have the kind of impact in your life that it's having. 
You thought perhaps you could navigate your kids being home and trying to do their schooling online. Maybe you thought that you'd be able to, to kind of navigate some time off of work because of shutdowns of things. And you thought you would be just fine. And now you're finding as the days roll on that your hope is fading. It was a false expectation. It's blocked your hope today. So how do these disciples, and what is the lesson that they can teach us about how we can find hope? Well, when life doesn't go as it's planned, when expectations are not fulfilled, hope can indeed be found. And we see a couple ways in this passage of Scripture that tell us how to find it. Look with me, starting in verse 25. Jesus is speaking to these two on the road, and he says to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and with all of the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all of the scriptures. One of the ways that we find hope is that we find it in God's word. In fact, hope is rooted in God's word. Jesus uses the scriptures to contrast the false expectation they had. He uses it to show a contrast between the plan that the disciples had about who Jesus was and what he should have come to do with what was God's plan. Verse 26 says, Was it not necessary for Christ to suffer these things and enter his glory. God's plan was not just for an earthly redemption, a physical redemption, but a spiritual and eternal redemption. And Jesus takes them to the word of God to help them discover that. I would say the same thing to you today if you are without hope. I would encourage you and invite you to look to God's word. The Gospel of John, where we began our time today, is a great place to turn. John's gospel is filled with wonderful truth about who Jesus is. It's a great place to begin. I encourage you to read God's word. But even more than just a simple verse, and certainly far more than any feeling or anything that we can grasp, hope is ultimately encountered in the living word. Hope is encountered in Jesus Christ himself. As we read in verses 28 and following, Jesus comes into the house with them. He reclines at the table and he blesses bread and he breaks it. And their eyes were opened. Hope is found in an encounter with the living word, not just with the recorded word of God, but the living word of God in experience with Jesus himself. And when we have that experience with Jesus, we begin to truly live in hope. You see, hope doesn't just impact our outer lives, but it impacts our inner life, our heart, our mind, our thoughts. It impacts every part of who we are. The disciples here, as they have experienced this encounter with Jesus, they say to themselves, did not our hearts burn within us as he broke the bread and as he shared the scriptures with us? You see, to encounter the living hope of Jesus Christ is to experience a life not just with a lowercase l, but life with a capital L. It is real life. It is true life. And you and I can live that today because of the hope of Easter. And much like Mary, the experience of hope is not something that we can keep to ourselves. In fact, verse 33 says they get up that very hour and they head back to Jerusalem with the news. They were not deterred by the miles they had already traveled or the miles that lay before him. They were not deterred by the time of day that they were making this journey because they had already told Jesus that it was late in the day. Perhaps by now it is well after dark, but that would not keep them from sharing the message of hope. Just like Mary, they came and they simply shared their story. And there's an interesting note that as they begin to share their story, the disciples there that are gathered in that place, they share their story as well. It's one of the powerful truths about sharing the hope of Jesus Christ with others. We find that when we share it, we hear it shared back. And like ripples in a pond or in a body of water that expand ever outward as we share, so the story of hope 
is shared further. One last story today, and it's found back in John's Gospel, and it involves the disciple Peter. You heard as I began today reading in chapter 20 that Peter had been one of those who had gone to the tomb. He had run with John to see if what Mary had said was true. But it indicates in chapter 20 that Peter does not seem to have any belief that it indeed is true. Remember, Peter is the one who had denied Jesus three times. Scripture records that all of the disciples, including Peter, had run away when Jesus was arrested. He was not present at the cross. He was absent. He had been a denier. And now here on Easter Sunday, he does not believe that Jesus has risen. Now, I will tell you that Luke's gospel does record that there is another occasion where Jesus appears specifically to Peter. But now let's pick up our text in chapter 21 in a story in the life of Peter and the disciples. And it says, beginning in verse 1, After these things, Jesus appeared himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he appeared in this way, Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, We will come with you also. And they went out and got on the boat. And that night they caught nothing. Jesus has gone fishing. Peter and other disciples had been fishermen prior to Jesus' calling. And now on this day after Jesus has arisen, they return to what they knew. They return to what they used to do. Some say that this believes a, a, an indication or is an indication that they are lacking real hope that the resurrection indeed is true. Maybe they've convinced themselves that what they had seen and heard is not really true. Perhaps they are just biding their time while they wait for Jesus to meet them in Galilee like he said that we, he would do. But whatever the reason, in the activity of their moment, they were unable to recognize Jesus. Let's pick our text back up again. Verse 4, But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. They didn't recognize him. So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not, do you have, or you do not have any fish, do you? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he had stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. Although there were many, the net was not torn. And now this wonderful encounter that Jesus has specifically with Peter. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples ventured to question him. Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. Now this was the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when he had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says to him again, or says to him, Tend my lambs. And then he asked the question again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter said again, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus replied, Shepherd my sheep. And a third time Jesus asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had asked him the third time, Do you love me? And Peter replied, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Tend my sheep. Marvelous encounter. Maybe you've been like Peter. Maybe you've run away from Jesus. Maybe you've denied him at some point in time. Maybe you've run from his plan or his purpose in your life. Maybe you've tried things on your own way and you found yourself failing. Well, hope comes to us 
when we have messed up and when we stand in need of forgiveness. Hope comes. Hope came for Peter. It came for the disciples. You see, Jesus could have very easily, to not only all of the disciples, but especially to Peter, could have given him the cold shoulder. I mean, after all, Jesus had heard Peter deny him three times. Jesus could have said, you know what? I am done with you. Never to speak with you again. He could have used the colloquial phrase, Peter, you're dead to me. But yet he comes. And he comes in the intimacy of a table of sorts. At the breakfast table. In the intimacy of fellowship and food, Jesus comes. A marvelous little anecdote about what happens when we encounter hope is that Peter does not wait to row the boat ashore. He jumps in the water and swims there first himself. The other passage that we had read in John, it was John who outran Peter to the tomb. In this case, Peter outswims the wall to be with Jesus because when you find hope, you don't wait. You run, you swim as fast as you can to the grace and the hope of Jesus Christ. Now notice again this specific encounter with Peter. Jesus asks Peter a question, the same question, and he asks it three times. I don't think that was an accident that Jesus asked the question three times. I believe that Jesus asked the question three times to mirror the three times that Peter was asked a question, do you know Jesus? Are you his follower? Jesus asks to mirror that denial. Why does he do that? Because Jesus is all about the hope of restoration in relationship. Even when Peter had gone the wrong way, when he had denied Jesus, when he had chosen the path of his own selfishness, his own self-preservation, restoration can come. You can find hope. And not only can you find hope, but we see in this gospel account a way that Peter can live out that hope. Because Jesus doesn't just offer restoration. Jesus says, I am not finished with you yet. There is life to be lived in relationship with me, the living hope. Jesus, in asking the question, do you love me, he invites Peter to tend and to feed and to shepherd the sheep, to shepherd the flock. The word that is used there in the original languages that to tend or to feed or to shepherd means to promote in every way the spiritual welfare of every member of the church. Jesus is not finished with Peter. Not only is Peter restored to life and hope, but he is using Peter in the days ahead to help other believers to know and hold on to that same hope. Peter himself and his writings in the New Testament, Peter wrote a letter to the church, actually wrote a couple letters to the church. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, we hear these words that Peter pens, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, and Peter experienced there on the seashore that day, around the breakfast table, Jesus experiences the incredible mercy of God. And, uh, according to this great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You and I today can live in spite of our failures, in spite of our past mistakes. Jesus invites us to be born anew to a living hope that is found in his resurrection. It's my invitation to you today to come and experience the living hope that Peter talks about. Not only that, in the third chapter, we hear these words from Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 15 says, Sanctify or set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts. And then these important words, Always be ready to make a defense or to give a reason to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is within you. You see, we are called not only to experience hope ourselves, but we are called just as Mary was. And just as the two on the road to Emmaus were called, we are called to share the hope of Jesus Christ with everyone who asks. 
And an important thing to note in this passage in 1 Peter chapter 3, we should live in such a way that hope is evident in us. The problem sometimes is we live in such a way that people have no idea that we know of the hope of Jesus Christ. So here's a question that I didn't put down in my notes that Mandy wasn't perhaps prepared to, to post for you, but here's a question for you. How are you living today? Or perhaps you want to just answer, are you living? And you want to say either yes or no. Are you living in such a way that the hope of the resurrected Lord is evident in your life? When someone sees you, when someone is around you, would they know that you have experienced the resurrected hope of Jesus Christ? We're called to share it. We're called to be ready at all times to give a reason for the hope that is within us. Well, as I close today, just a simple question for you. What is keeping you from the hope of Jesus this, this Easter? What's keeping you from the hope of, of Jesus this Easter? Is it grief or pain or loss in your life that you've experienced Maybe it's grief, pain, and loss that has come because of this present pandemic crisis. Maybe it is a false expectation that you had. Maybe you had your life all planned out and it has just not worked out that way. And you're barred from hope. You're blocked from seeing and experiencing hope. Maybe today what keeps you more than anything else from the hope of Jesus this Easter is your sin your rebellion against God. You've thumbed your nose at God. You've said, I don't want anything to do with him. I think I can make life work pretty well on my own. It's blocking you from hope. What is it today? And I want to let you know that this can be true for folks that do not know Jesus as their Savior. And it can be true of us who have journeyed with him for long periods of time. We can find ourselves, because of the circumstances of our life, unable to see the hope of Jesus that is right before us. But the good news is, is that the hope of Jesus can come to you and I no matter where we are, no matter where you are today. No matter what you've done, what you're going through, Jesus' hope can come to you today. In Jesus, you will not only find hope, but he will give you the grace to live it, and he will give you the power and the want to, to share it with others. He will lovingly move you from that place of hopelessness, just like he did with Mary when he spoke her name, just like he did with the disciples at the table when he broke bread with them and he shared the word of God, just like he does with the disciples and particularly with Peter here on the seashore. He will move you from hopelessness to a place of life, a place of joy, a place of purpose. Today, if you would like to connect with us, if you'd like to say, hey, I would like to know more about what it is to live in the hope of Jesus Christ, I would love for you to connect with us. And I just want to point you back to that link there on our page for our digital connect card. Maybe you just want to fill it out, give us your contact information. Maybe you could just say, Pastor Todd, I just would love for you to pray with me today about where I am. This is what I'm going through, and I need the hope of Jesus. Would you be willing to share with us through that Connect card how I can do that? Maybe today you're thinking to yourself, I would like to know more what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to receive his saving, redeeming work that he did on the cross that is evidenced by the empty tomb. Fill out that Connect card and share with me that. I would love to connect with you and help you begin that journey with Jesus because it is a journey of hope and joy and peace. He does not promise that he will make everything instantly better. But what he has promised us is that he will never leave us or forsake us. And what the cross and specifically the empty tomb tell us is that there is absolutely nothing that we can experience in this life that he does not have victory over. Because if God can take the most awful day of Good Friday when his son dies on the cross and take what is the most awful thing and turn it into what is the most glorious thing, then he can take you from wherever you are and turn your life into one of beauty. He can take the ashes of your life and turn it into beauty. He can take what is broken and make it beautiful. And I would love to help you begin that journey today. In just a moment, as I close in a word of prayer, I want to invite you to do one more thing with the chat feature. Maybe you would want to articulate today in a chat, if you feel comfortable doing this, 
a prayer request or a concern that you have, and you just like to say, Pastor Todd, I would love for you to pray with me about this. And church, we can pray for one another, perhaps, as we see these requests shared. But maybe you're not super comfortable sharing personal information like that. You have a prayer request, and maybe this is a way that you can articulate it. In your chat feature, you have the opportunity to choose little uh, emojis, little icons that indicate how you're feeling. And there's a, a raised hand icon that's a part of those emojis. And maybe your response today in saying, I have a prayer concern, would you pray for me, is just to put that raised hand icon. Maybe you just want to simply put the word yes. Yes, Pastor Todd, I have something that I would want you to pray with me about. Would you be willing to share that today? A raised hand, a word yes as we close. Would you bow your heads with me today? Oh, Father God, thank you for today. I thank you for the cross and Lord, I thank you even more for the empty tomb because you indeed have conquered sin, death, and the grave. And because of that, we can experience the victory and the hope of life in Jesus Christ. Lord, we can experience life with a capital L, a life that not only gives us joy, but Lord, a life that calls us to your divine purposes, to share the hope of Jesus with those around us. God, help us to know that today in its fullest reality. God, I pray today for every articulated prayer request, whether it's through a simple word, yes, a specific prayer request articulated in words, or a simple icon of a hand raised that says, yes, I have a prayer request. Pastor Todd, God, do you see my need today? Well, just as you saw Mary there in the garden and you called her name, just as you saw the disciples walking on the road to Emmaus, just as you, you saw the disciples there in the boat waiting for a catch, you see every need today. You see every heart, regardless of where they are. Many are watching today live within this county, in Portage County, Ohio, or in cities that are a part of our county. Some are watching this video from counties far away, states far away. But God, you see them where they are today. Lord, would you speak their name? Would you speak into their heart today words of hope that says, not only do I see you, but I have hope for you today. God, thank you for our time together. I thank you for this joyous Easter Sunday. Lord, would you continue to do your work in our hearts and our lives, not only this day, but Lord, help us to be a resurrection people, an Easter people every day of our lives, this day and all the days that you give us. Lord, we thank you. We love you this day. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Well, blessings to you today as you spend your time on the remainder of this Easter Sunday. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for those that hosted watch parties and invited others to be a part of them. I want to encourage you that you can share this video. Uh, a little side note, Facebook is a little because of the amount of users that are using Facebook and posting videos. They sometimes are a little slow in getting them posted. So keep watching Facebook. Eventually, this video will be shareable for you. I encourage you and invite you to share it with others. Uh, this video will also find its way to our YouTube page, and you can point people to our YouTube page that you can have them encounter the video as well. I want to invite you to join us on Wednesday night for Bible study or on one of the Zoom meetings this week. Let's stay connected in our faith. Let's grow together. Let's continue to live in the resurrected hope of Jesus Christ. So blessings today, folks. We'll see you later. Bye.